Bazel Baz is founder and president of the Association for the Recovery of Children. Baz is known as the patron of saint for missing kids. He is a former CIA intelligence special operations group paramilitary case officer, recipient of the Intelligence Accommodation Medal, former counterterrorism officer in the United States Marine Corps, and a graduate of the Citadel. Baz is well known globally for his expertise and extraordinary skill set, author of Terrorism Survival Handbook, and several other books. He has been called on by CNN, CNBC, and MSNBC as an advisor and spokesperson on the war on terrorism and homeland security. He is also a film and television writer, producer, and actor. Basil Baz co-starred as the commander of Raymond Reddington's paramilitary group on NBC's The Blacklist for four seasons. As a life coach and a well sought after motivational speaker, Baz travels nationally and internationally to provide breakthroughs to awesome performance with an uncanny ability to bring simple solutions to complicated scenarios. Without further ado, Bazel Baz, everyone. Um, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And let me tell you what, there are far greater men and women than I that should be standing up here. So it's, it's certainly a privilege. Um, I am the founder of the Association for the Recovery of Children. And what we do is we fight child sex trafficking. And that is an issue that each and every one of you, if you're not encountering that now, will cross your path somewhere in your future, particularly when you leave here. So let's go ahead and get started. Where did it all begin for the Association for the Recovery of Children? Let me get my little clicker here. All right, 1993, Mogadishu, Somalia. That's a region that some people know from an incident that occurred there called Black Hawk Down, and they made a movie out of that. I was inserted as a CIA Special Operations Paramilitary Case Officer to gather, uh, to gather intelligence, among other things. Attachments included what we call center spike operatives from the United States Army and a few Marines. On a given day, while we were running operations, we found two little girls hiding underneath some debris. We noted their location, but we counted them as collateral damage, and we went on about our business. But something didn't sit right with us that night back in our safe house, particularly in our hearts. We wrestled with the thought of those two little girls not surviving the next day. I went on the roof of my safe house, I looked up in the sky, blanketed with a billion stars. And I looked up and whispered, dear God, why aren't you doing something about this? And as sure as I'm standing here, a small voice out of thin air said, I am. I created you. I turned, but no one was there. It was one of the spookiest moments of my life. So I joined the team downstairs for an intel briefing. And after Rich finished, he turned at the door upon his exit and he said, oh yeah, by the way, there's an American lady who opened up an orphanage here in the war zone. And then the light bulb went off and we all realized, hey, we can take those kids there. The next day, this is our team horse. Uh, that's me standing in the middle with the, the car. These are some of the center spike guys. Those were the attachment of Marines. You can see I had shorter hair. It was darker then. That means I'm an old guy now, but I'll bet you I can outrun any of you on a 24 miler. 1993, uh, we went back the next day. We grabbed our battle gear, went back to that location to where we last saw the little girls, but our hearts sunk because they were nowhere to be found. And we searched and we searched for about a good hour. And then as we were departing, our translator, Ibrahim, who was a Somali uh, recruit for us, said, stop, there they are. And they climbed out of some debris. They came from the, another part of the compound. We talked to them in their language. We picked them up. We gave them water. We gave them food. We took them to the orphanage. 
We dropped them off. It's these two little girls you see in the green T-shirts here. One was 16, one was 10 years old. The place on the left is near the area where we found them. The little girl in the green shirt, as we were leaving the orphanage, wrapped her arms around one of our center spike guys. She was crying, and we thought she was saying, thank you. In fact, what she was saying was, could you go back and find our mother and our little brother? So we spent the next four days, again, pretty much against anything we were supposed to be doing, which was outside of collecting intelligence and fighting a war. We found her mother and her little brother at this refugee camp on the right-hand side here, and we reunited them. I got back to the United States, and I started asking the question, what's happening to American children? At that time, I found out that there was 250,000 missing children in 1993 in the United States of America. So I got with my law enforcement partners, and I said, what's being done about it? And they said, well, terrorism has a priority, homicides has a priority, car theft has a priority, burglaries have a priority, but children are not a priority. We count them as runaways, and nothing was being done. So I all of a sudden got to thinking to myself, you know what? There's something bigger than overthrowing small governments. And I set upon a journey all by myself on every Thanksgiving and every Christmas from 1993 to 1996 to go rescue one kid each time. And that's what I did. I founded the Association for the Recovery of Children, and soon after that, Different tier one operators who knew that I was up to something said, I want to join, and I want to help, and I want to make a difference. Most really decorated war fighters. And so, in 19, right, 1996, I made a choice to get out of the CIA, something I loved doing, and start the Association for the Recovery of Children. The Association for the Recovery of Children is a 501c3 nonprofit organization of former intelligence, military, and law enforcement officers that are dedicated to the recovery of missing and exploited American children. After all local, state, and federal uh, activities or help has been exhausted, we get involved. Donations finance our missions, allowing us to do this at no cost to the custodial guardians and with no paycheck in our pocket. In other words, we volunteer. And why do we do that? because it's the right thing to do. Never forget that. You do honorable things in life because it's the right thing to do. Thus far, we are blessed to have a 100% success rate and that every child we've gone after, foreign and domestic, we've brought home. Now as of 2019, get this, there were close to 421,000 children missing in the United States. The pornography, child pornography industry is a $3 billion industry annually. So let me ask you a question. Where do they keep all those kids before they put them in cameras and shoot them? And let me ask you another question. Even if you don't give a rat's ass about trafficked children, do we have a national security issue here? Yes, we do. Let me tell you why. Because if you can transport children around the United States without detection, what else can you transport around the United States without detection? Nuclear weapons? Terrorists? Drugs? Exactly. And the word trafficking is so common nowadays, and I'm sure you've heard that term many, many times, that most people don't even blink an eye when I mention it. So let me tell you what it really is. It's paid child rape. That's it. It's paid child rape. Somebody pays money to rape a little girl or a little boy, anyone under the age of 18, actually. And it is a booming business, not only globally, but in the United States of America. Most people say it doesn't happen here. It happens over there. I'm in the trenches. It happens here, and you need to be aware of it because it's going to come knocking on your doorstep after you graduate from here in one form or another. No sugarcoating it. It is the brutal abuse of children, 
through torture and beatings and imprisonment, sometimes being burnt with cigarettes, things that I would not even do to my worst enemies as a CIA interrogator. So let me give you an idea of what type of missions we run. This is the story of a little girl named Willow Bradfute. That's her standing next to us right here. This is a former Navy SEAL and some Mexican Special Forces guys. And this is, of course, when she got home. This little girl was abducted out of Colleen, Texas, years ago, by her mother. Now, anybody that tells you that their parents would never sell anybody in the trafficking are wrong. Her mother got out of prison. She hooked up with a Colombian drug guy. They went into Mexico. They came back, and they kidnapped Willow Bradfute. They took her to Mexico, and they tried to extort the family for $50,000, or they would sell her into prostitution. Seriously. So I got involved. We got a call from some former Navy SEAL friends of ours. We opened a command center down in Colleen, Texas, and started negotiating with the, the bad guys, which was basically the perpetrators or the kidnappers. We got them from $50,000 to $5,000. Then we went into Mexico to make the exchange of the $5,000, of course. And while we were there, we were on the telephone with... Uh, the, one of the perpetrators, and we never could get him to settle on a place to meet. Um, have anybody been to Mexico? Okay. You know that big old Vatican Square area where those three big giant churches are? You know that area? That's where we agreed to meet. So the first time, we said, we'll meet there, and we'll bring your money. And he would call back later and say, no, I changed my mind. We're not going to meet there. We're not sure where we're going to meet. So then we would call him again on the phone, and we'd set up a new place, and he would say, okay, I agree. And then he would say, no, 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 I changed my mind again. It got to the point that we weren't even really sure if we were going to ever get the girl. We thought we were going to lose Willow Brad Feud. She would be sold into prostitution. So finally, I played the card that I don't like to play, and that is simply on the phone, about the fourth time on the telephone with him, I said, you know what? You can keep the girl. You can keep her. Now, that's not what my heart said, but I was trying to figure out a way to make our operation work. And I said, in fact, you can keep her, and we'll call Interpol, and Interpol will hunt you down. They'll kick your door in. They're probably going to kill you, and then they'll get the girl back. So then he agreed, okay, I'll meet you. Lo and behold, guess what happened again? An hour later, he calls back and says, I changed my mind. I'm not going to meet you. You're bluffing. And now I'm at my wit's end, and it's like, what can I do? Dear God, what can I do? So finally, I tell him, I say, look, I want you to go look out the window. And he goes and he walks over. And then he runs back. And he goes, okay, I will meet you. Now, I have absolutely no idea what he saw out the window. But whatever it was, it worked. And so we ended up meeting him at that Vatican Square. I ended up meeting him in the back pew of a Catholic church, you know, the one where you pull the little things down that you get down and kneel on? Because I had all the money in my boots. And there were a lot of tourists around, and I didn't want them to see the transaction. And I looked at him after we gave him the money, and I said, here's the deal. I have two shooters outside, and we're going to take this long walk. And if anything happens, you're going to be the first guy to go down. Are we clear about that? It got really quiet, and I said, so you're going to get on the phone, and you're going to tell your thugs over there to stand down. He got on the phone. He told them. And as we were walking across the big square, um, lo and behold, Thad and a couple of other operators that aren't up here were already standing within two feet of his thugs, which was a great feeling to have. I got to Willow Brad Fute. I knelt down in front of her, and that's what we always do. We always kneel down in front of a kid, because they're generally, their self-esteem is just gone. Their head is down like this. They don't know what to do. And I knelt down, and I looked up at her, and I said, Willow, we're from the United States. You're going home. She lifted her head. She smiled. I said, I want you to take my hand, and we're going to walk across this square here, and we're going to get you home. And so we did. We took her back to the American Embassy. 
State Department showed up there. Uh, a member of ICE came out, and he said, what are you doing here? He goes, did you not get our memo that said, don't come to Mexico? And I said, well, not really. Now, we really did, of course. Um, but I said, no, we didn't. And he said, man, my boss has got to be really pissed. And so he goes upstairs, and he comes back about 20 minutes later, and he says, uh, these four ladies from Citizen Services, they're going to take Willow, and they're going to process her passport. And he said, I need to speak to you privately. And I thought, oh, this is great. They're going to throw me in jail or something. My own country is going to throw me in jail. He pulls me off to the side, stands there, <clears throat> clears his throat, <clears throat> and says, good job. I would have done the same thing. And the next thing you know, we're out of the country. We're back into Houston. I'm walking through with little Willow Bradfeud, and she hold, look, stops me in the middle of the airport, looks up at me, and she says, Mr. Boz, you know what? If I could have another dad, I wish it would be like you. And I told her, she's got a dad, and he sent us, and he loves her and everything. Now, the reason I tell you that is for every child that you rescue, that you get involved with, you're going to become their parent. You're going to become their hero. You're going to save their lives. Because some of them don't have families. They come from rotten families. Fortunately, she came from a great family. So this was a great success story. Now I'm going to tell you about another operation we did. This girl's name is Nikki. She was sold into sex trafficking and child pornography at age seven by her mother and her father. Who would do that? And from age seven to about age 15, she was a sex and labor slave. She had been auctioned off. She had been tattooed on the back of her neck with a barcode. She had been implanted with a chip so that if she ran away, other traffickers could read the chip and tell who her boss was, not her boss, her owner was. She had been interrogated. She had been whipped. Her back had scars like you wouldn't believe it. She had been tortured in un every unimaginable way that you can think of, right? So when she was about 15 years old, she escaped. And she made her way to a church in a certain state, a really big church. And there she found refuge. And there was a female youth pastor that befriended her. And on a given night, the female youth pastor said, you know what, come over to the house. We're going to have a girls get together. We usually have a little slumber party. You know, we eat some popcorn. We just do what girls do at slumber parties. So Nikki showed up. Nobody else was there except for the youth pastor. thought that was a little odd, but the youth pastor played it off and said, well, you know, I don't know why people didn't show up. Well, look, you and I, we'll just have a pajama party ourselves. Go change in the bedroom. So Nikki goes, as a 15-year-old would go, into the bedroom, she closes the door to change and put her pajamas on, but what she failed to notice was on the outside of that door, it was a lock. And that lock got locked. And she thought it was a joke. She kept grabbing the door and saying, hey, hey, come on, let me out, let me out. That door opened 30 minutes later, and the youth pastor, the female youth pastor, white, walk, walked in along with a sheriff who hand, headed up a human trafficking division. And they commenced to rape her brutally for the next three or four hours and put her back in slavery and trafficking. Now, why did I tell you that story? Because nobody's immune. Pastors, lawyers, doctors, law enforcement, school teachers, the list goes on and on and on. The number of people we find that are involved in trafficking of children every single day. So they put her in trafficking. And not only did they put her in trafficking, but interesting enough, and this, this report is actually up at the Department of Justice now. They're doing some work on it. There was a slew of law enforcement officers across the nation here in the United States that were all involved in human trafficking. Hopefully, by the grace of God, they get all rolled up here pretty soon. Anyway, her life was miserable again until she was about 21 years old. We got her kind of out of the trafficking arena around 21. We usually don't deal with anything over 18 or anyone over 18. She came to her, she, her brain had been so, uh, she had been so brainwashed that she actually was taught by the female youth pastor biblically 
that she was sent here on earth to be a sex slave. That's it. Her whole, everything that she knew about her faith was so twisted and upside down, it was pathetic. So, on a given day, we met with her in a park. We had been trying to get her moved further on down the life to what we call aftercare. And she said, I'm going to go back to my traffickers because they love me. They beat me. I wouldn't want anybody else to go through this. They've tortured me, but they love me. It's their way that they love me. And she disappeared. We lost contact with her for about 30 days. One day, one of our assets named Footprint called us up and said, um, hey, I got to tell you this story. I got a call from the FBI. They asked me to fly down to Houston, Texas. A guy picked me up at the airport. They put me in a nondescript vehicle, no license plates, blacked out windows, SUV, took me into a nondescript building, took me into a nondescript room, and in that room there were four body bags. There were four body bags because Nikki's body had been chopped up in so many pieces that they were put in four different body bags. She was able to identify half of her head, the tattoo on her shoulder, and all of that stuff. And then those so-called FBI people, follow me here, started interrogating her. She got scared. She said, hey, I'm supposed to go on a mission trip to Costa Rica here pretty soon. Everybody knows I'm down here. I need to go back home. And they said, not a problem. So they put her back on the airplane. They sent her back to Los Angeles. She told us the story. I called my contacts in the FBI, and I said, how come you guys didn't tell me that you found Nikki's body? They said, well, we didn't find Nikki's body. I said, well, how come you didn't tell us you flew our asset down? They went, we don't fly anybody down. Who is that powerful where you can literally imitate the FBI? That you can fly someone someplace to identify the bodies? That you can drive around in a nondescript SUV with no tags and not get pulled over by law enforcement? And in addition to that, we checked with Southwest Airlines, and Southwest Airlines had no record of her making the flight to Houston. And in fact, they had no record any longer of her last four trips over the last four years on Southwest Airlines. Who is that powerful where you can erase someone's flight log? This is the level of sophistication we are dealing with now in the United States. Whether it's MS-13, Bloods and Crips, Mafia, Cartel, whatever it is, even at the, most, the highest levels in our government sometimes, we're dealing with a very sophisticated business model that can get away with trafficking people all over the United States and make them vanish. Unfortunately and sadly, that was how Nikki ended up. The protection of American children, know it now. It's your duty. It's my duty. It's our duty. The hearing and the reading of the trafficking issue may be useful, but if men and women rest in just hearing and praying, as so many do, about this issue, it's as if a tree should value itself on being watered and producing leaves and yet never producing any fruit. The fact is a child does not come home until there are boots on the ground that physically bring that child home. Now, most people spend a lifetime wondering if they've made a difference. Folks, I don't have that problem. And I don't want you to have that problem when you leave here today. When it comes to rescuing children, it's very simple. If we do not, who will? That's it. The Constitution of the United States says we the people. We the people. It's our responsibility. These children are our responsibility. Make no doubt about it. These are God's kids. And he's speaking to each and every one of us in a world of unprecedented evil that is out to destroy our children. If we allow our children to grow up in a dysfunctional environment, they'll grow up to be dysfunctional adults. Is that really who you want running America in the future? So let me ask you a question. How do you murder a child without killing them? Think about that. Not a riddle. How do you murder a child without killing them? 
The answer is you sexually exploit them. There's a spiritual component of every human being, and it's called the soul. When you traffic children, you molest them, you abuse them, you exploit them, their soul is ripped out of their very being. And each of you knows that. Just take a moment to remember when you were a child. And if you were a child and you found yourself in this same situation, would you not want someone to come rescue you? Therefore, I implore you to not to shy away from your duty to prevent our children from being exploited. My father said there's only two types of people in this world. And I believe him. He's a good Green Beret. A couple tours in Vietnam, a little bit with the CIA and a few other things. He was solid as a rock. There's only two types of people. There's followers and there's leaders. That's it. Now I see in front of me an entire room of leaders, and I mean that with all my heart, that are willing to say that this will not happen on my watch. I'm not going to let this happen to the rest of the kids in America. I'm not here to show you how to fulfill any position of prominence, but positions of obedience, responsibility, integrity, and perseverance. What we do takes great leadership, and great leaders have the mark of dedication, initiative, and hard work that contributes to the overall mission accomplishment of rescuing children. The mission must be bigger than the person. So let me tell you something. If you wish to be great, commit to something greater than yourself. Whatever it is you intend to be great at, it must have such a priority in your life that you will stop at nothing to achieve it. It must be more than just an idea or a really nice thing to do. It must be a calling. And you'll know the difference because there will be a gnawing at your soul that will not go away and that what you're about to accomplish must be done at all cost, even at the expense of your own comfort, and in extreme cases, at the expense of your own life. And in that process, you will face obstacles. We do every single day. For the untrained mind, the obstacle becomes a hardship. But for the trained mind, an obstacle is simply something we overcome. Now, I know there's a number of you sitting out there right now. You're looking up here and you're saying, well, this is easy for you, Mr. CIA Special Operations guy. You're trained. Okay, Spanky, let me tell you something. You and I have something in common. It's the most important thing. We both have 24 hours in a day. So what are you going to do with yours? I want you to find your value in who you are with this whole issue, not in what you do. A lot of people think it's really cool what we do. We don't find our value in, in this. You have to first find your value in who you are. And at the end of the day, just know this, people aren't going to remember what you've done or I've done as far as our good deeds unless they write it in history books. That's reality. But they will remember your character and how you treated them in accomplishing those deeds or what type of courage you displayed or the moral compass you used to remain fair and compassionate and wise. Oh, you might have a few medals on your uniform for some downrange time, but honestly, who in the civilian world actually knows what all those medals stand for? They might think you look great and that you're all that in a bag of chips, but when they speak to you, they don't size you up on what you did. They size you up on who you are. Put you in civilian attire and none of us look any different than Adam. So what comes out of your mouth better be polished and it better be impressive in ways that says, I can lead you to victory. Now, if you're sitting there right now wondering how you could step up to the plate to this call of action, rescuing children, and you're still a little apprehensive, let me say this. If I have 99 cents and I go to the bank and I ask them to give me a dollar, will they do it? No. Why? Because we're one penny short, right? 
It's that one penny that completes the dollar. The one penny is actually the most important part. So for all of you there that are feeling kind of alone, if you ever choose to pick up this fight, just realize you may be that one penny, the most important part. And it may very well be you that completes the efforts of a non-government organization like ARC, who's struggling to win the war on trafficking. Never forget this. One man, a one woman with courage, is a majority. Now, I look out at the crowd here, and I see what you're thinking a little bit. And I can see this because, you know, I was a spy, and spies have special powers, and we can read your mind. So, some of you are saying, well, I don't know if rescuing kids is really prestigious enough for me. Here's what I tell you. Surrender your desire for prestige. I remember a story about a pastor who attended a seminary and knew that once he got his master's degree and then his doctorate, he'd no longer have to drive the crappy little car around. You know, the one with the Band-Aids on the door? and the chipped paint and the sun-faded roof that looks like acid rain has fallen on it every morning, the kind that blows smoke out the back because it's burning oil, and the seagulls have used it as a bombing range since the first day you bought it, that kind of car. It was an embarrassment, to say the least, but it was all he could afford, and it did not reflect the status of anyone with a college degree. He pulled in the university parking lot, He sat there, looked up, and was going to tell God about his plans to one day very soon have a more prestigious car, something that reflected his position as a theologian. All of a sudden, he hears tick, 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 as another crappy car pulled right along next to him and parked there. He looked up at God, and he said, well, thank you, Lord. At least I'm not the only one that has a crappy car. Someone can share in my pain. And as he looked over, who do you think he saw? The head of the theology department. He looked back up at God and said, oh great, now I can aspire to get my doctorate and have a much better crappy car. You see the guy in the other car, and he cared less about what he was driving because it wasn't about prestige. He was comfortable in who he was. Sometimes we think We're holding on to possessions, but in reality, those possessions are holding on to us. We're deceived in thinking a lot that things are essential, when guess what? They're not. So I've been in this war for about 27 years now, and one day after seeing as much of all that ugly side of trafficking that I could stand, just like the devastation I saw in Somalia in 1993, I paddled out on my board in California, And as the sun settled on the horizon and the new moon crested up in the skies, I looked up once again and I just said, Dear God, why are you not doing something about this? And as clear as day, just like in 1993, he repeated, I am, I created you. So I'm here to tell you the same thing. If you want to know if he's doing something about it, he is. He created each and every one of you. And your lives will never be the same after this day sitting here and knowing what I'm sharing with you. It will never be the same. You will never be able to rest until you get involved and you do something about it on one level or another. I've found the greatest leaders in my life to be warriors, just like all of you. Many of them fight right alongside of the Association for the Recovery of Children and Saving Children. Warriors know that there are no Asian Americans, there are no Irish Americans, there are no African Americans. Guess what? We are just all Americans. And every one of those children we go after, they are just Americans. If you believe otherwise, you take a trip downrange with me when I'm contracting and you help pull my buddies out of the trenches and you'll find out we all bleed the same color. There's no diversity preached in our ranks or in the soul of true warriors, only unity. Never forget that. 
A warrior's strength is measured by the size of their heart. You show love, you show respect, and you show honor. And you stand, and you fight in the face of adversity for the things and the ones you love, like children and the Constitution of the United States. Unashamedly, you are sometimes their only voice. And you are their shield. You lead by example, always remembering who you are. If you do this, I promise you, if you do this, you will create a life that feels good on the inside, not one that just looks great on the outside. Now, I don't teach my strike force recovery team to be safe. I teach them to be brave. There's nothing safe about Angola or Iraq or Afghanistan. And there's nothing safe about the operations we run to go rescue children from MS-13 or the Bloods and Crips or the cartel or whoever else it may be. And there will be nothing safe about the life you embark upon when you graduate GMC. Should you feel the slightest bit of apprehension regarding how you'll brave the seas of deception and criticism and lack of support in this world, and trust me, you will, just remember what I said earlier. One man or one woman with courage is a majority. May God bless each of you, and may God bless our great country, the United States of America. Thank you very much.